following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. We have been following along in these past several weeks the letters to the seven churches. And uh, these seven churches, the churches in uh, Asia Minor, which is in modern day Turkey, Remember that John was in, on exile on the island of Patmos. He was there because he was being persecuted for his faith. And he had this vision, this revelation of Jesus Christ. And in that revelation, it included these letters to each of the churches. And today we come to the fifth letter, which is the letter to the church at Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you still have a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white. For they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity we have to study and explore it together. We ask that as we do, you would speak to our hearts and you would change our lives. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. On August 11th, 1974, six years of careful planning went into that date. And after those six years of careful planning, a French high wire walker named Philippe Petit managed to put a cable between the twin towers of New York's World Trade Center. He was 1,362 feet in the air. Over the next 45 minutes, he walked back and forth eight times between the two buildings, which were 200 feet apart. And didn't just walk on the cable, he danced, he knelt, he even laid down as he saluted the police officers who were waiting to arrest him when he stepped off the cable. Petit's accomplishment garnered worldwide attention, and as a result of that newfound fame, he was hired by the Ringling Brothers to perform in their circus act. It was the day of his inaugural performance, and he was walking in the air 40 feet, 40 feet above ground. And during that session, Philippe Petit fell. He broke a few bones. And more than that, he was upset at himself. He said, I can't believe it. I don't ever fall. How could someone successfully walk 1,362 feet in the air and then a short time later fall from 40 feet in the air? The answer lies in this word, and the word is complacency complacency. When you're walking on the wire 1,362 feet in the air with those gusty winds buffeting your body, you are very much aware that your life could be over in any second. Your nerves are on edge and you're on high alert. You're paying attention to what you're doing and you are well aware of the dangerous situation you're in. But when it's just, just 40 feet, you're only walking 40 feet in the air with no one watching, then you drop your guard and you become complacent. And that's what happened to Philippe. Complacency is defined as a feeling of pleasure or security, often while unaware of some potential danger. So you feel like, hey, things are going well, it's all good, and you're not aware of the danger that might lurk right around the corner. According to our passage today, complacency isn't just a bad thing, but it can be a deadly thing. It can be a deadly thing. And that's why one scholar dubs the Church of Sardis as the Church of Deadly Complacency. As we've made our journey through these letters to the seven churches, the first item that we always encounter is Jesus identifying himself. And in this letter to the church at Sardis, Jesus reveals two things. He says he is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the seven spirits of God, that sounds kind of, kind of weird. What are these seven spirits? Well, this is a symbolic way that the book of Revelation describes the Holy Spirit. Seven is the number of perfection, the number of completeness. And so the seven spirits refers to the Holy Spirit in all of the Spirit's fullness. And so on one hand, he has the Holy Spirit. And the complacent church at Sardis needs to recognize Jesus 
as the one who brings this life-giving spirit of God. And they desperately need this life-giving spirit in their deadly situation. But Jesus not only has the life-giving spirit, he also ha holds the seven stars. Now, back in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, we're told that those seven stars refer to the churches, to these churches that Jesus is addressing in the book of Revelation. So Jesus holds the life-giving spirit in one hand and the churches in the other. And so after he identifies himself, he's ready to get into the letter. And normally the thing that we expect to see is Jesus giving the church a commendation, saying, hey church, these are the things that you're doing well. I'm going to give you a thumbs up, even if it's one of my hitchhiker thumbs, but I'm going to give you a thumbs up. You're doing these things really well. And Jesus kind of cheers them on and says, keep doing what you're doing. And you can imagine this church, this letter would have been read aloud in each of the churches as it traveled uh, throughout Asia Minor. And uh, the Christians in Sardis, they've, they've been listening as the book of Revelation has been read. And they've heard Jesus commend the believers in Ephesus and Smyrna and in Pergamum and Thyatira, and now it's their turn. And they're eagerly awaiting, oh, I wonder what good things Jesus is going to say about us. I wonder, I wonder what thumbs up we'll get. What, what, what positive thing is he going to say? And then, and then Jesus says this, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Well, that's uplifting, isn't it? You're, you're a bunch of dead people. Just imagine, that's what you came to hear today. You're dead. We expected to hear something positive, but this doesn't sound good at all. Jesus indicates that the churches have a reputation. You know, just as people develop a reputation over time, so also churches develop a reputation. And that reputation could be good, it might be bad. And that raises a question, what kind of reputation does our church have? If a news reporter went to people in our community and asked about our church, what would those people say? If someone went to our neighbors and our coworkers and asked about us, what would they say? What kind of reputation do we as Jesus' followers have. Surprisingly, the church in Sardis has a positive reputation. People talk well. Oh, they're a, they're a great church. They're on fire. They're very active. They're, good. they're a good congregation. But appearances can be deceiving. On Facebook, it looked like the perfect church, but in reality, it didn't live up to its profile. And Jesus says, you have this reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Even though people seem to think you have it all together, you are like spiritual zombies. You are the walking dead because your reputation doesn't match reality. Despite that reputation for life, despite that reputation for vitality, the church in Sardis is not alive at all. It's dead. And what's worse is the church doesn't even seem to be aware of its true condition. And they've overestimated themselves. They think they have it all together and they are indifferent about their true condition. And that's why there's no praise. That's why there's no compliment for this church. There's nothing to soften the blow of what Jesus says because this is a dire situation and it requires an urgent response. Jesus is concerned about the believers in Sardis and so he shouts to the church, wake up, wake up church, wake up. Some other translations put it as watch out. But in both of those phrases, we hear a call of awareness, a call of vigilance. Knowing a little bit about Sardis can help us understand Jesus' call to be alert or watchful. First, the people of Sardis were known as sardines. No, that's actually just a bad joke. That's not what they were really known as. But I did hear that they really packed them in there. Ah, okay, no, no, never mind. That was bad. Okay, I'm moving on. Now, the residents of Sardis were actually known as Sardesians. Sardesians. And the city was built around and defended by this nearly uh, unscalable cliff. Think about this mountainside cliff, a huge, huge cliff that no one could go up. And the Sardesians thought that their city was invincible. At one point, the enemy uh, king of the Persians came and wanted to conquer Sardis. He wanted to make it a strategic base for his military campaign. And the problem was he couldn't figure out how to scale the cliffside. A Greek historian actually tells us how one of the king's soldiers was studying the cliff. He was trying to figure out some way, any way, to plan attack, uh, an attack against the city. And so he's there watching one day, and one of the Sardesian soldiers that's guarding the cliff drops his helmet. Just went, drop, just went, uh, you know, rolling down the mountain. And the enemy soldier watched. And the guard from Sardis, he climbed down the cliff. He retrieved his helmet and he climbed back up the hidden pathway. Well, the Persian marked down the path that that 
guard had taken, and he rushed to tell the king. That night, the Persians scaled the path that that guard had used. And when they got to the top of the battlement, the Persians found it completely undefended. The residents of Sardis had gone to sleep because they didn't have to worry about their city. It was, they, they couldn't penetrate this place. They had become lax. They had become lazy in their watchfulness. And the Persians took the city with ease in one night. This lesson from the history of Sardis teaches us a crucial lesson concerning our faith. That we should never stop seeking out the Lord and growing in our walk with God. One of the dangers that we fall into is the belief that we're okay. We don't have to worry about anything because we, we went through some rite of passage. We're okay with God. I don't have to do anything else. And these rites of passage could include things like baptism. I'm baptized. I'm good. Uh, I, went, I went to the altar and, and I responded to the altar call. I'm good with Jesus. I, I said a prayer. I, I uttered the sinner's prayer and I'm good. I'm good. All those things are, are great. They're important things to do. But here's the thing. They're only the beginning of the Christian faith. But we, we treat these things like, oh, I did those things, and now my golden ticket is stamped, and I don't have to worry anymore about how I live. I can just go on doing whatever I want to do. But following Jesus is not a one-time decision. Following Jesus is a continuous and sometimes costly commitment. It's not a single choice, but it's a lifetime of choices, sometimes small choices, sometimes monumental choices, but these choices impact everything, everything, our relationships, our careers, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, where we go, what we do. All of these choices can either draw us closer to the heart of Christ or they can contribute to us drifting away. In the church at Sardis, they had this reputation of being faithful Christians, a, a reputation of being alive, but they had become complacent. They had lost the focus of their faith because they had failed to grow in their walk with the Lord. They just kind of said, it's all good. We can just rest. As one teacher put it, the Christians at Sardis had grown content with a mediocre, halfway comfortable, convenient Christianity. And Jesus came along and checked their pulse and pronounced them dead. Now, as grim as these lessons might be for Sardis, they can help us. Help us to recognize that our faith should be more than a description of where we spend our Sunday mornings. It should be more than a bumper sticker on our car. It should be more than a family tradition. Our faith should be the rhythm for our daily living. Our faith should be the rhythm for our decisions. It should be the defining quality of our character. It should be the most distinctive and compelling element of who we are. Sardis didn't fall victim to false teachers or to bad doctrine or even to violent persecution. They were laid low by the fact that their faith wasn't something they lived or even seemed to understand anymore. They had grown content, they quit growing, and it had become little more than an ID card. That's what their faith had become, an ID card and a false confidence. Following Christ wasn't an expression of their heart anymore. And that's why Jesus gives Sardis and us a wake up call. He tells us to stop thinking that our faith was something we did in the past. Our identity as Christ followers is not defined by an experience we had as a kid or because of a moving weekend retreat or because of our church attendance record. Sardis had a faith that Jesus called unfinished. And we can't, be, we can't afford to be found accused of the same thing. You know, God designed us to grow. Growth is not optional to followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus can never rest. We are always a people in progress. We never reach the point where we're there and we can just rest on our laurels because God is not done with us. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been following Jesus. God is not done with you. And so Jesus says, strengthen what remains. Strengthen what is about to die. Even though your reputation doesn't match the reality, even though things are dire, Jesus says, there's still some hope. There's still this little wick. It's barely flickering, but it's there. Jesus' words remind me of a scene from The Princess Bride. Wesley, the leading male character, is carried into a room on a primitive form of life support. And the medicine man, played by Billy Crystal, is dubbed Miracle Max. And he looks at Wesley's friends and he says, Your friend here is only mostly dead. But mostly dead is still slightly alive. Mostly dead is still slightly alive. And Jesus was saying the same thing to the church at Sardis. You're mostly dead, but you're slightly alive. 
Strengthen what remains. Build that up. You might be knocking on death's door, but no matter how complacent you've become, there's still hope because there's still something burning. There's still something alive in you. And Jesus' message to Sardis is his message to us. Strengthen what remains. Finish what God started in you. Remember what you've been given. Hold on to it and return to that life that follows Christ. What's this life that follows Christ? It's more than a Uh, wearing a t-shirt or posting inspirational quotes on social media. Jesus is talking about having a story, a life story that is so closely entwined with his heart and nature that you can't be accused of being asleep. And the amazing truth is, is that through Christ, it's never too late. Jesus doesn't speak to the Sardesian Christians in order to perform a funeral. He calls out to them in order to spark a revival. And we have the chance right now to decide to wake up and to finish the story of faith that Christ wrote on our hearts no matter how long ago it was. Jesus tells them, remember what you have received and heard. Remember what you've received. What was it they received? It was grace. It was God's love. It was God's mercy. It was God's free gift. The story starts with us in brokenness and then Jesus drenches us in grace. And it doesn't start because we're cool, we're awesome. It starts because God is gracious and God is amazing. And God says, go back to that spot. That's what Jesus tells the Sardesians. Go back and stand under the waterfall of grace. Remember what you have because all growth as a follower of Jesus is grounded in grace. It is a gift of God. And the good news is, is that if we allow God's grace to work in us, we can be overcoming victorious Christians. The question that this text raises, which is the same question that all of our uh, texts, these seven letters of the church has raised, is are we victorious Christians? Are we overcoming Christians? Can we overcome the sin of complacency? And the good news is, is that the answer to this question can be a resounding yes. You and I can be victorious Christians, not because we're talented or hardworking, but because Christ has already won the victory. And we who belong to Christ have the Holy Spirit living in us. And the Spirit gives us the power to be spiritually alert and to be vigilant in our faith. Remember, remember how Jesus introduced himself in this letter? In the one hand, Christ holds the Spirit, the Spirit that gives life to the church. And in the other hand, Christ holds the church that needs the life of the Spirit And both of these are held by Christ, and he brings them together. The spirit that brings life and the church that is in need of the spirit. And those who live overcoming lives, those who allow God's grace to work in their lives, those who allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives, to those people Jesus makes several promises. First, those who persevere will walk with the risen Christ dressed in white. As we talked about earlier, white robes connote purity, and they were worn on festive occasions Uh, The Roman generals would wear them when they celebrated victory. It's a sign of victory. Jesus also promises that those who overcome will not have their names blotted out of the book of life. The book of life was a way of speaking about citizenship in the kingdom of God. Some cities would blot out the names of those that they dropped from their citizenship roles because they expelled them or executed them in some cases. But Jesus assures the Christians that those who conquer will not lose their citizenship in the kingdom of God. On the contrary, Jesus will confess their name before God because it's Jesus' judgment that matters and not our reputation among humans. So today, we hear again this message and this call, this call to wake up. And whoever has an ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, not only to the ancient church of Sardis, but also to the church of Jesus Christ today. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the church at Sardis. And Lord, we confess that we, like the church at Sardis, sometimes get complacent. We sometimes think it's okay. People look at us all right. Our reputation's all right. But what really matters is where we are in our relationship with you and what you say about us. Lord, tonight and uh, today, Lord, we confess that, that, that we need your grace. That grace that has worked in our lives in the past, Lord. At those moments, those important moments when we have opened our heart to you. 
That grace isn't finished with us yet. We are still works in progress. And I pray, Lord, that we will allow your spirit to come and to work within us. That we would quit, Lord, resting on our laurels and being complacent in our faith. And that we would move forward in faith with you as we open our hearts to the moving of your Holy Spirit. May we open our hearts today, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We read the story of honor and glory and praise the name of Christ. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.